announcements in our afternoon session. I have the privilege of introducing our third speaker, Dr. Andrew Henry. Andrew is an associate professor and curator of fish at the Red Path Museum and the Department of Biology at McGill University. He received his bachelor's in science from the University of Victoria in British Columbia and received both his master's and his PhD from the University of Washington. His research interests include evolutionary ecology and specifically how ecological changes influence evolutionary dynamics. Throughout his career, he has published over 120 publications, which I'm sure that number is growing daily, um, in all excellent peer-reviewed journals. And he has co-authored several books on eco-evolutionary processes. He has been awarded honors from the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, as well as the American Naturalist Society. The Henry Lab uses a combination of empirical work, theory, modeling to better understand interactions between ecological and evolutionary processes. Today he will be speaking with us about a talk titled Progress Towards Ecological Speciation in Guppies, Sticklebacks, and Darwin's Finches. So with that, please help me welcome Dr. Andrew Henry. Brian gave us a lot of examples in his talk 
about how individuals are moving between different locations within a single species. So when that happens, it means that the two populations can't go on their own separate evolutionary trajectories and are instead bound back by the, the bungee cord of gene flow, which prevents the formation of new species. So in that situation, you imagine that the phenotypes are still divergent because they're being pushed apart, but they can't get as divergent as they would need to be in order to form new species. So I'll give you the, the, the likely and obvious route out of this, but first just let me set up the, the conceptual framework for how that pathway will become important. So I'm just going to summarize what I've already said. That is, you have uh, some sort of environmental contrast. So I'm going to talk about three environmental contrasts different types of seeds, different sizes and hardness of seeds for Darwin's finches, lake and stream environments for stickleback, and of course high and low predation environments for guppies. That imposes divergent selection on those populations, as I showed here, it's pushing them apart. And the adaptive divergence that results from that is a reflection of that adaptive response to those different environments. But, because of ongoing dispersal between the environments, you have gene flow that continues, which prevents adaptive divergence from occurring to the extent that would be necessary for speciation to take place. But the way out of this problem is to evolve reproductive barriers that reduce gene flow. Space will do it, but so will adaptation. In particular, as you adapt to different environments, there are a whole bunch of processes that kick into play that mean that you will have reduced gene flow between the populations in those different environments. And so the process of adaptation has a direct feedback to gene flow and reduces it. So adaptive divergence begins, gene flow goes down, which allows more adaptive divergence, which further reduces gene flow, and so on, until you get separate species. So my lab is interested in understanding this entire dynamic and its feedback to ecological processes in a bunch of natural systems and in theory. And the reason why we study multiple natural systems, I just realized I was going to say, is because thereby we can get more general insights. And, but really it's just because they're all cool systems, eh? Uh, you know, I go to the lab and goes and I, you know, I, I have a student who worked on sharks and you know, salmon in Alaska and stickleback and British Columbia and guppies and things that. So that's the real reason. But, just pretend I didn't say that, and instead I'll say that by studying multiple systems, we have the ability to see if similarities among those systems allow us to have any emergent generalities. Or, whether or not those systems give us different and idiosyncratic responses that tell us additional insights into what's important for speciation and what is not. Okay, so what I want to do then is I just want to focus in on one part of that, that diagram, that one thing that I told you was a way out of this problem of gene flow. And that's this arrow here. Now, that effect emerges from two steps, which I've already discussed. One of them is that disruptive or divergent selection is driving adaptive divergence between populations. Now, that can occur in two ways. One is that you have alternative resources or alternative environments or something like that. They're just two different things, and those things differ in the different places. Or, if you're in the same location, disruptive selection can emerge from competition for shared resources. So if everybody's competing for the same thing, it often is good to be divergent from the common type, and you can have the emergence of two species in sympatry, from the process of competition pushing apart and favoring extremes. Now, either of these two things is causing populations to diverge in the traits that are important for improving fitness in those local environments. The next step then is the key one, and that is that reproductive isolation, reduced gene flow, evolves as a consequence of that adaptation, of that adaptive divergence. So adaptive divergence becomes the reason for reproductive isolation. Now, I'll just give you a quick summary of ways in which this might occur. These are just logical possibilities. Imagine that you have populations in different habitats, and they adapt to those different habitats. If that's true, then selection should obviously favor them to 
stay in or return to those different habitats, which will mean that they will encounter each other less and breeding between them will be less. So that's one possibility for how adaptation to a particular environment will reduce gene flow. Another one is that different environments often have different phenologies, different timing of the spring bud burst, uh, different timing of uh, flooding or something like that. If so, organisms often evolve their own reproductive timing such that they will be successful in those different temporal environments. And if they're breeding at different times, then they're not going to interbreed. But let's say that habitat choice isn't perfect, let's say that temporal isolation isn't complete, and you do get switching between environments. In that case, since individuals are adapted best for the other environment, they should have reduced fitness as they go to a new environment. So populations adapted to two different environments, if individuals move between them, even if it's at the right time, they will do poorly because they're not adapted for the other environment, which will further reduce gene flow. But let's say they survive. In that case, maybe the traits that are involved in adaptation to those different environments also influence mate choice. And if they do, individuals might preferentially mate with individuals from the same habitat type, which will further reduce gene flow. And you make it through all that and you actually produce hybrids, the hybrid should presumably be adapted for neither of the parental environments, and therefore also have low fitness. So let's say you wanted to study these processes and reveal them. In, so David pointed out that when he started his work on guppies, the important thing to do is to take like a, the most extreme examples from the ends of the regression. That way you can be most sure that you're going to find your effect. So let's pick one system in the world where we would be sure to find these effects. And I would argue that that's going to be Darwin's finches. The reason is, is that, maybe not in as many words, but people have thought that this is how Darwin's finches evolved for the longest time. They all show incredibly different beak morphologies, which are very well suited for the diets that they feed on. These guys with big beaks feed on really hard seeds, all the way down to warblers that feed on little tiny things just like a warbler. But they've all evolved from a common ancestor in just a couple of million years. So people have always thought that adaptation to these different environments was the reason why you have 14 different species. So we wanted to study these processes in action, and so logically this is the place to go. So here's an example of some finches doing their usual things in Galapagos. So you see irradiation of different types. This is the famous woodpecker finch that uses tools. This is a vegetarian finch, and one of the most striking things about it is it looks fat. And the reason is, is that it has a much longer digestive system, a larger digestive system for better digestion of otherwise hard to digest plant material. Then you have a series of uh, insect eating finches, the, the tree finches. This one's not actually eating an insect, but that's their common food. The cactus finch with a long beak that specializes on cactuses. And then a series of similar in shape <coughs> ground finches that all feed on seeds. And that's the part of the radiation that we've been studying. So we're looking at those guys there, from the small beak version on the left, to the medium ground finch in the middle, to the large ground finch on the right. So let's go to Galapagos and take a look at what the distribution of those beak sizes look like in nature. So we'll go to uh, Galapatero, which is a, a specific site on the island of Santa Cruz here. So here's the main tourist town. Here's Gadapatero. That's located right there on the central island of Santa Cruz. Collect all the finches that you can get with mist nets and just look at the frequency distribution of their beak sizes. You see this. So this is number of birds over here and this is the size of the beak, an integrated measure of the width, depth, and length of the beak. And you see bumps and dips in the distribution. So bumps and dips. Those, those bumps and dips, some of them correspond to the different species. So here's a small ground finch over here. There's a long distribution for the medium ground finch. And there are a few of the large ground finch. They're relatively rare. But that wasn't what was interesting for us. What was interesting for us was to look at this distribution of the medium ground finch. And you see a whole bunch of small beak morphs that are declining. But no, they actually show a jump up again here. 
So you have a small beaked version and a large beaked version of the same species. Importantly, these differences are not trivial, and so you can take and categorize a small beaked fortis here and a large beaked fortis, both within the same species. Now, some people think that we've confused that, and that's the Magnorosterus, the large ground finch, but if you take that same bird around and flip it around and compare it to a Magnorosterus, you see another jump in the robustness of the beak. So this is a really big difference within a single species. And, importantly, they're not separate, so we have intermediates. So this means that we can go into this one population, this one natural system, and try and see if all of the things that we would predict about ecological speciation are taking place right there. Wow. It's a football game, right? Okay, so let's take a look right here and see if we can see that. So what would the theory predict? if adaptation is what's driving speciation in this group. So let's make four predictions. One of them, you can make other predictions, but these are ones that I can actually test. One of them is that they should have an ecological contrast. In particular, the two morphs within the one species should feed on different foods. So we'll first look for that. They should also be under disruptive selection. We use the term disruptive because they're in one place rather than divergent. In the sense that the intermediate birds and the dip I showed you in the distribution, they should survive at lower rates. That would be disruptive selection, maintaining this polymorphism within one species. In addition, because beaks are important for the production of song, and song is how females make choices, we would expect that you might have mating isolation. Each morph should prefer to mate with its own morph. I'm going to need another laser pointer. This one's battery is dying. Okay, so now if you have disruptive selection, meaning the intermediates don't survive, in addition, you have a relatively rare production of intermediates, you would expect that within this one species, you would see low gene flow between the two morphs. That is, they should be reproductively isolated. And maybe we can detect that with neutral markers. So what I want to do then is simply take and examine each of these hypotheses in this one population. And what you'll see is that I'm going to test those same <coughs> questions in the other two systems as well. So I've got what amounts to a, approximately a single slide for each of these. So we'll go through those and then we'll move on to the next system. So an ecological contrast that should feed on different foods. So we've done a ton of work characterizing what these finches are feeding on. And this is this one graph showing the relationship between beak size on this axis here, and two different axes of diet variation. And the key thing is that the large beak birds, in the red there, are feeding on something very different. They overlap, but they're feeding on something different from the small beak birds. So there is, so there is an ecological contrast between the large beak birds and small beak birds. With that in mind then, which is what we expected, let's take a look to see where the intermediate birds are doing poorly. So to do that, we want to look at the relationship between fitness, in this case interannual survival, and the size of the bee. Now disruptive selection, which is what we're looking for, is typically thought to be something like that, so a little smiley face, where you'll have high survival if you're small, and high survival if you're large, and low survival if you're in the middle. But if you remember that there's a species on either end of this distribution as well, there's another species over here that would be a competitor, and another species over here that would be a competitor. So maybe in an idealized world, we might see something like this, where a typical small morph will have high fitness, and a typical uh, large morph will have high fitness. There'll be low fitness on either side of that distribution, and the intermediates will have low fitness. With this being what we really care about. Of course, you never expect real data to look quite that beautiful. So we tested that by marking a bunch of birds in a number of different years, and here's the first time we did this, which allowed us to ask how many of these birds that we marked in this year, abandoned this year, survived to the next year, and survived to two years later. And what were the beak sizes of the survivors versus the dyers? Same thing in another year with a larger sample size. So I'll just show a graph like the previous one, where you have fitness on this axis and beak size on this axis, and we're looking for, well, in an ideal world, we have the the, the, the two hump count, right? 
We definitely don't want the one hump cap. So, you know, it's funny because there are many times when, I'm sure you guys have an analysis where you've done all this work and analyzed all this stuff, and, but you don't know the actual outcome yet. You've got some hypothesis, it's your baby, you, you, you want it to come out. And, do you ever like pause before you hit the enter button? And just hesitate for a second think, does it matter how I push this button? Right, because you know, my, it's, it's going to be science and nature or it's going to be the proceedings of the Southwest Natural History Society of College Station, right? So, push the button and my God, they look just like the prediction. This never happens for me. Where you have really, you have the highest probability of survival if you're a small beak bird or a large beak bird and you have low fitness in the middle. Selection against intermediates, disruptive selection. And the same thing occurs in the sense that you always have low fitness and intermediates for all the selection episodes we looked at. So that's one thing that we would indeed expect if adaptation was what was driving these species differences. Now what about the assorted mating? So here we went out and looked and saw who was mating with who and what kids they were producing. So the expectation now is that large beaked females are mating with large beaked males and small beaked females are mating with small beaked males. So now I'll show a graph of female beak size versus male beak size. And we're just looking for a positive association. So I didn't push the enter button this time, but, but the student did a great job. I mean, look at that. All the small beak females are mating with small beak males, large beak females with large beak males. And it's the same in multiple years and wet and dry conditions. But importantly, there are some cross mating which is what's producing the intermediates, which are then being selected against. So, if you add all this up, you would imagine that that suggests that these two things should be on their way to becoming separate species. And so we should be able to use neutral markers to detect differences between them, if we look hard. So we tested that with uh, microsatellite loci. And in this case, I'm going to show you a plot of genotypic space and dots of different colors for the two different morphs. And the question is, how much they overlap? Are they just two completely overlapping clusters? Here are the uh, genetic differences if you're used to looking at those kinds of statistics. So here's genotypic space in two axes. The red points are the small morph, and the green points are the large morph, and they overlap. They are the same species in the same location, so that's not particularly surprising. But they show the beginnings of a separation where most of the large beak morph are over here and most of the small beak morph are over here. Which would be inconsistent with random mating across that distribution. So there is restricted gene flow between them. It's not so much that we go to the point of calling them separate species, but they are showing the reflections of these adaptive processes that are reducing gene flow. So we seem to have strong evidence for ongoing ecological speciation in Darwin's now, that was a case where it would seem really obvious that we were going to find it. So why not do that again? Why not go to the next system in which you would, really the next system in the world where you would expect to also find the ecological signatures of reproductive isolation evolving? And that would be Tree Spine Stickleback. Because much of our current understanding of ecological speciation started with work on Tree Spine Stickleback, particularly by Dolph Schluter. So, these fish colonize a bunch of freshwater environments from a common marine ancestor and show amazing divergence in morphology and a whole host of characteristics between different freshwater populations. And this all evolved in the, since the last glaciation, so maybe 10,000 years. So you have incredible adaptation to different habitats in freshwater in 10,000 years. And the part of that radiation that I study is how stickleback adapt to lakes and streams. Now, when I started this work, there had been three lake stream pairs <coughs> that had been examined. And this is showing the data for averages for lakes and stream fish for two traits that are important for foraging and movement. The number of gill rakers, so these are projections on the inside of the gill, that, on the gill arches that play an important role in foraging in the sense that if you eat small things, you should have numerous, long, and finely spaced gill rakers 
so the food that goes in your mouth doesn't just go out your gills. If you feed on larger things, then you don't want long, finely spaced, and numerous gill breakers. So, indeed, lake fish in each of the systems have more gill breakers, because they're feeding on small zooplankton, than the stream fish. In each of those systems, those stream fish are feeding on benthic macroinvertebrates, which are much larger. In addition, they differ in body shape. This is just one metric of it. So it's that lake fish have a shallower body relative to their length than do stream fish. Now, the reason why I say that when I'm looking at these two graphs is that these two fish have about the same body depth, and yet they differ dramatically in length. So in each system, lake fish, probably because they're doing continuous swimming in the open water searching for zooplankton and prey, have more streamlined, shallower bodies than do the stream fish, which are spending much more time in sort of marshy, shallow habitats on the sides where there are complex environments, and maneuverability is going to be more important. That's what we think. So two traits, very important for survival of stickleback, are diverging in parallel in multiple systems. So we went first and looked at this one system here, the Misty Lake system. So Misty Lake system is characterized by a small, shallow lake, and two streams, one that flows into the lake, right here, it's a marshy stream, you don't think fast flowing mountain streams, right, think marshy beaver damming kind of streams, and also a stream flowing out of the lake. So if you go and sample fish and look at those same two traits, gill rakers and body shape, you see something like this, which is what you saw before. Lake fish have more gill rakers, they're feeding on presumably zooplankton. Then stream fish from the inlet stream. And the lake fish have shallow, more streamlined bodies than the stream fish. Importantly, these and many other differences have been shown to be genetically based. So it's not just phenotypic plasticity. Instead, we've confirmed through many multi-generational uh, common garden experiments that these differences are genetically based. OK, so now you've got a new system with adaptation to two different environments. What does the ecological theory predict if that adaptation is promoting their speciation? Predicts the same things that the Darwin Smith has predicted with slight twists. First, there should be an ecological contrast. In this case, the lake and stream fish should have different diets. That's what's driving these trophic related traits. In addition, instead of disruptive selection, they're in different places, so they should be experiencing divergent selection. And we should be able to detect that if individuals that move between the lake and the inlet have lower fitness than residents that stay home. So if you're a lake fish and you swim into the stream, you should do badly. If you're a stream fish and you swim into the lake, you should do badly. And because many of these traits, body size and shape and a whole bunch of other things I haven't told you about, influence mate choice in stickleback, we would expect mating isolation as well. Each ecotype should prefer to mate with its own ecotype. Lakes should like lakes, and streams should like streams. And, just like before, because of these two things here, we would expect low gene flow, where we might be able to detect lake and inlet populations being reproductively isolated, even using neutral genetic markers. So just like Darwin's finches, let's take a look at each of those predictions for this system. This is the ecological contrast, and as I noted before, the main contrast is between zooplankton, so limnetic food, and a lot of benthic macroinvertebrates and other benthic foods. So it's a limnetic benthic food contrast. Here are six different lake and stream pairs with misty lake on the end. And you can see that the proportion of limnetic clay, prey, zooplankton in the diet is much higher for lake fish than for inlet fish. This is the same in all lake stream systems. Lake fish tend to feed on zooplankton, stream fish tend to feed on benthic macroinvertebrates, benthic food. So there is an ecological contrast. Now, I wanted to skip, instead of showing you the two reproductive barriers, I wanted to start with the overall outcome for gene flow, for a reason that will become apparent in a minute. So we wanted to see if there was limited gene flow between lake and inlet stream fish. So we looked at mitochondria and microsatellites using a whole bunch of different microsatellite panels. I'll just show you two results because they all say the same thing. The first is that there's a big difference in mitochondrial DNA clades between the inlet fish and the lake fish. Remarkably, that difference is true even right beside the lake. 
So these are just 100 meters from the lake. So that suggests very low maternally mediated gene flow. But there might be paternally mediated gene flow. So let's look at neutral, uh, nuclear markers, microsatellites. And here's just a clustering diagram that will illustrate the genetic differences. In particular, lake fish are very different from inlet fish. As an aside, you can see the outlet fish are just like the lake fish, which is a different story about how gene flow can have an overpowering effect on all of this. You cannot escape it sometimes. But that's a different story, so let's not worry about it. Now, the reason why I showed you this first is because this shows there is limited gene flow, so there is reproductive isolation. But we can't tell if it's ecological, because although they exchange very few genes, ecological differences are confounded by geographical differences. They're in different places. So maybe it's just hard to get between the two places. So what we need to do is we need to break this confound by creating artificial syntax. We need to bring them together and see how they do in a survival context and a mating context. So we did that first with selection against migrants. So this is divergent selection. We created enclosures in the lake and the inlet, and we marked lake and inlet fish, put them into those enclosures, and then looked at their survival and growth. With the expectation being that in the lake, lake fish will do well, and in the stream, the inlet stream, stream fish will do well. So I'm showing the data for uh, growth, which is essentially changes in body mass adjusted for body size, for the inlet and the lake enclosures, and the lake and the inlet fish. Now, everybody lost weight, which is actually probably a good thing, because it means that we're not giving them easy conditions. And if you're going to detect selection against migrants, you don't want things to be easy. And if you look in the lake enclosures, the prediction is beautiful. Lake fish do much better in the lake than in lake fish. So you should have selection against migrants. So that everything fits. Now in the inlet enclosure, the inlet fish will be here and the lake fish will be here. Right? Well, I was getting nonchalant about my button pushing at this point. And, uh, I guess I failed because that's not at all the case. Lake fish seemingly do better in the inlet stream than do even in the so this is the first of the contradictory results that I'm going to present to you, and there will be others. So this suggests that there would be an asymmetric selection against migrants. So if you went in the one direction, you'd do poorly, but if you went in the other direction, maybe you'd even do better. I want to point out that this is a very common assay used in Stickleback that has shown these nice crossing lines in many other instances. So although there's problems with this experiment, it's clearly not the same strong effect you find in other stickleback systems because we replicated those methods. Okay, but maybe even if they do okay moving between environments, they show very strong assorted of mating, which would reduce the gene flow. So we create artificial sympathy there by bringing them into the lab, making sure that they have a common garden environment so they're not looking at plastic effects. Raise them up from uh, from babies, and then. Let males build nests in tanks and presented females to them. Lake and inlet females to lake and inlet male. And so the question is, what's the mating probability for an inlet female with an inlet male or a lake male? And for a lake female with an inlet male or a lake male? So clearly the, the red bar will be high here. Inlet females will like inlet males and the blue bar will be low. And over here, the blue bar will be high because lake females will like lake males and the red bar will be low. So let's first look at inlet females. And it, it, it's the opposite. If anything, inlet females seem to prefer lake males. But, you know, maybe we can save it here. <laughs> it's the exact opposite. And no, I didn't screw up the colors. <laughs> they, if anything at all, the lake females actually So, maybe it's not occurring here, maybe it's the hybrids that are having a problem. So we did the same thing with hybrids and compared them to pure types and found out that hybrid males do better than pure types in competition with pure types for mates. So we have no evidence that divergent selection led to a positive sort of mating. So this means that 
in contrast to Darwin's finches, we have little evidence for ecological speciation in our lake and stream system. So let's set that aside for a second. Because what we clearly need is a tiebreaker system, right? Finches said yes, Stickleback said no, we need a tiebreaker. And what better tiebreaker could we possibly have than Trinidadian guppies? Because as you saw from the morning talk, if you were here, they show incredible adaptation to different environments. And here are some pictures of the color variation among different populations. Now I can go quicker on the introduction here because uh, David gave it earlier. I'll just do the quick reminder for, and also for those folks who weren't here, that in Trinidad you have streams that flow down out of the mountains, both the north and the south, and as they do so, they go over waterfalls. As you move down from the mountains, you'll find sites with no guppies. Then you go over another waterfall, and there'll be guppies present, but no major predators. Then you go over another waterfall, and the guppies now have to coexist with major predators. So the key contrast here is between the low predation guppies up here and the high predation guppies down there. And as you saw, low predation guppies and high predation guppies differ in a whole bunch of different things that seem to reflect adaptation to these different environments, whether it's directly because of predators or because of indirect ecological effect caused by predation. These are just some quick examples of things. David emphasized uh, female life history. But the truth is there's a whole cottage industry of take your favorite trait and go down to Trinidad and look at it in high and low predation guppies, and it will differ. Any, almost any trait you could possibly imagine. So my point in saying this is that clearly adaptive divergence is extremely strong between these two environments. And if adaptive divergence is what's causing reproductive barriers, then surely they should be evolving in this system. So predictions are the same. As a matter of fact, they're identical to those for stickleback, except for the specific selective force. Ecological contrast, in this case, the different environments, high and low, should have different mortality schedules. In addition, we would predict that selection against migrants would occur, reflecting divergent selection, such that guppies moving between predation environments should show reduced survival. In particular, those naive, poorly adapted, low predation guppies should do really poorly in comparison with the super guppies in the high predation environment. So if a low predation guppy goes over a waterfall, it should be toast, which would reduce gene flow because of, it's not well adapted. And because some of the things that diverge between these populations, including color, influence female mate choice, we might make the simple prediction that you would also see mating isolation. So each ecotype should prefer to mate with its own ecotype. Low predation females should like low predation males, high predation females should like high predation males. And as before, because of these two things and other possible barriers. We should expect low gene flow between high and low predation guppies, such that the ecotypes are reproductively isolated. And we can detect that with maybe neutral markers. So let's take a look at each one quickly. This one, the different environments should have different mortality schedules. Uh, David already said that was the case. And in our study, that was true as well. Here are five different low predation guppy environments and the daily mortality rate. And here are five different high predation environments and daily mortality. So on average, mortality is considerably higher in high predation environments and low predation environments. There's a lot of variation in high predation environments, which is another story that I'll have to tell another time. But on average, the prediction is very much uh, upheld. So if that's true then, this selection against migrants should kick in. This idea that low predation companies going over the waterfall should be really poorly. So we took a bunch of low and high predation fish, individually marked them and genotyped them at microsatellite markers, and released them into a novel high predation site. So what should happen, of course, is that the high predation fish should do really well, and the low predation fish should do really poorly. So first let's look at survival. And the two blue lines are for uh, females and males, high predation fish, and the orange lines are low predation fish. And this is how many individuals are still alive through time. So there's a huge effect of maladaptation on survival. These low predation guppies die off really quickly, presumably because of the predation. Now, we can also ask if there's any genetic consequences of this by, in these experiments that we conducted, we did two of them, 
We took low and high predation fish, put it in the site, and we can go back and see which kids were produced in the next generation by these low and high predation parents. And that works because in each of the two environments, high and low predation fish that were put into them, in each of the two experiments, are very different genetically. This is just showing they can be very well classified into two genetic clusters. And that was true in both experiments. But then when we looked at the recruits in the next generation, you can see that almost all of them were produced by the high predation fish that were put in. Which means that those low predation fish going over the waterfall are having a hell of a time. So this fits very nicely with the ecological theory of adaptive radiation ecological speciation. What about mate choice? So in that uh, context, we did a classic experiment in ecological speciation where, sorry, our experiment wasn't classic. The method was based on classic experiments in ecological speciation. Where you have multiple independent origins of the two types, and you ask females from each of these different populations, high and low. By the way, the colors are actually reversed here. So the red should be here, and the blue should be there. So we ask females from high and low predation environments if they preferred high or low predation males in the laboratory, controlling for environmental effects. So first let's look at the low predation females. So what you're seeing here is the response of females to displaying males, if those males are from the same predation environment, or from the same river, or from different rivers, versus males from the other predation environment. So low predation females, like low predation males, and dislike high predation males, from no matter where they're from. So a female from one river in a low predation environment will prefer a male from a low predation environment in a totally different river over any high predation male. Which is also perfectly consistent with the expectation that adaptation is promoting reproductive barriers. High predation females though might be more interesting because they're the ones that are potentially receiving the males coming over the waterfall. So let's ask about them. Well, that was the exact opposite. So here you can see the high predation females actually disfavor their own males relative to the low predation males. So low predation females are picky, they prefer their own type. High predation females are less picky, and if they are picky, they actually prefer the other type, which is not consistent with the prediction. But makes sense in retrospect because Low predation males are colorful, and so if they do survive, the fe general female preferences for colorful males might mean that they're attractive to the females. So I'm giving you mixed results now for guppies, and the question is how do they play out with respect to neutral markers? So in this case, we took samples from high predation sites and low predation sites in a bunch of different locations in one river system. And we asked if the genetic differences between these populations were greater if they were in different predation environments than if they were from the same predation environment. So just to sort of reference you to the graph I'm going to show you, here are, here's an assessment showing the effects of geographical barriers to gene flow, which should be important, right? So if these are all pairwise genetic differences between all those populations that I showed you, this is the geographic distance between them. So it makes sense, right, if you're further apart, you're exchanging fewer genes, you have greater genetic differences. In addition, the blue plots are for populations that are separated by waterfalls, and the red dots are for populations that are not separated by waterfalls. And, as you would expect, for a given geographical distance, if you're separated by a waterfall, you have lower gene flow, higher genetic differences. So, just to give you an illustration of how this would play out then for ecological differences, I'll recode these points according to whether they're in the same predation regime or different predation regimes. So the expectation from ecological speciation is that, for example, now the blue points are different predation regimes, and the red points are the same predation regime, for example. So what does it look like? <coughs> Nothing at all. You can find no signature in neutral genetic markers the gene flow is reduced between high and low predation. No evidence of different environments in this gene flow. So let me summarize the guppies. 
to say that we found evidence for strong selection against migrants, but low to high duration migrants may have higher mating success, possibly leading to no net effect on gene flow. This big but is actually referenced to the same thing that Brian pointed out, that it turns out that neutral genetic markers are not very good for detecting progress for ecological speciation. Setting that aside, we used a bunch of simulations to show that these two counteracting effects, selection against migrants, but maybe higher mating success, can indeed lead to no net effects on gene flow. So at this point, I'm pretty sure you're, you're all thinking, well, so what message am I supposed to take from all this, right? You haven't given me a clean, neat, and easy story. And in reality, that was kind of uh, the point, because for me, this was sort of a, a journey through um, negative results, if you will. And, and I can literally remember lying in bed, it's burned into my brain, going over these results. Student after student came to me with an experiment, and she didn't find the result that we were expecting. Another student came and gave the same result. We say, okay, try something else. Let's look at hybrids. Hybrids also didn't have a problem. So I can literally remember lying there in bed, just agonizing over this thing. Oh, those students, they all want to you know, get jobs at you know, Texas A&M, but they're going to end up getting jobs at you know, the Southwest Texas Community College, right? Because they can't publish their stuff in good papers. And I was literally just lying there going, oh my God, when I knew my wife is quite happily dozing. And it's like there's some little diode in my brain that just popped and said that, well, maybe my results are actually right. Maybe there is these limitations on gene flow. And maybe adaptive divergence doesn't always drive speciation. Which makes sense in retrospect, right? It seems obvious because think of all of the different populations of a species that exist across the world adapted to different environments. And yet they're clearly not on their way to being separate species. So this freed my way of thinking about this problem, where I first started thinking about the point that it's not a yes or a no thing. Did ecological speciation occur or not? That's not, that's not the question. Because you have speciation as a continuum. You start with little differences and they accumulate. And so we might think about that more profitably as asking, what are the stages along this continuum? And how far are you on that continuum? What got you there? And why aren't you getting further? So for example, you start with basically continuous adaptive variation without any reproductive isolation. Just a big panoramic population. Then, as a result of adaptation in different environments, you start to get discontinuous adaptive variation, so adaptive divergence, coupled to the beginnings of reproductive isolation. A little bit farther on this continuum, you get large adaptive differences with reproductive isolation that's strong, but nevertheless reversible. Meaning that if the environments change, the barriers would break down and they would interbreed again. And maybe, if you keep going, you end up in a situation where you end up with adaptive differences with irreversible reproductive isolation. They're permanently sundered, never the twain shall interbreed again. They're separate species for now and evermore. And as I said, the question is, where are we on this continuum? So I spent some time thinking about different fish populations, different post-glacial fish populations, and where they would fall on this continuum based on the previous work. So there's a variety of studies of different fish species that can potentially place things along this continuum. And then I decided to use this continuum as a way of attempting to understand the forces that are pushing you along it and forcing you back on it. Now, I wanted to give you the, the sort of journey of personal discovery about ecological speciation, but I'll just give you the tiniest tidbit of the way that we're approaching this problem now, which is what I've just been saying. So we're specifically asking about the factors that are constraining and promoting progress along this ecological speciation now we're looking at a variety of things, such as the rate of dispersal, the strength of the environmental contrast, the nature of the mating system, and the role of phenotypic plasticity. So I won't go into details about the specific questions we're asking there, except to say that in each case, there is a reason why some of this is good, but some of it would be bad for progress for speciation. And so we could use 
theoretical models to explore those possibilities. And so with uh, Xavier Fibert plans came, we did a whole bunch of studies where we looked at various factors in theory influencing ecological speciation. And then we started exploring, particularly in stickleback, multiple lake stream pairs to try and figure out how far are they, what got them there, and why aren't they further. So here's just the tiniest example of that, where you have eight different lake stream systems, one lake sample with L in each, and six stream samples at varying distances from the lake. We can quantify the ecological contrast, the adaptive divergence, and the genetic isolation based on different colors of those points. And doing this, we can see that here are three systems where ecological contrast is large, adaptive divergence is large, and we see two well-defined genetic groups. By contrast, you have three other systems where there's not much ecological contrast. Lake, lake and stream uh, prey uh, feeding is about the same. And you don't have much adaptive divergence. And you don't have as distinct genetic clusters. So in those systems, a lack of strong environmental contrast is preventing ecological speciation. In another system, you have a, this is the misty outlet now, the one I pointed out briefly earlier. Here you see lake fish show a large environmental contrast with the stream fish, but they're not adaptively divergent and they're a single genetic cluster. So in this case, dispersal is so high that they haven't gotten anywhere. In addition, even in these systems here where you see strong divergence, the lakes, the stream sites close to the lake, are also not genetically distinct from the lake fish, which is also an effect of dispersal on overwhelming this process. So we're doing that, that's all in British Columbia, but we've also asked about different continents. So it turns out that lake and stream fish are much less divergent in Europe than they are in the classic systems in British Columbia. Why is that? Why, why are Europeans not good at speciating? To that. Certainly good at forming separate countries when it comes to humans. So we've done that. We've also done a whole bunch of comparative genome scans where we now look across the entire stickleback genome in each of multiple independent lake stream pairs and we can detect signatures of selection on particular loci and we can also ask how the nature of outliers accumulate from systems with low divergence, again this is the outlet, to systems with very high divergence. Do you build more and more separate peaks, or do the peaks just get bigger? Or does the whole genome continue to diverge? So, in the end, I hope that this research program will carry me forward for, uh, until I retire, I'm sure, and beyond, where trying to understand how ecological speciation is often promoting divergence, but often it also does not get us all the way we'd like to go from the perspective of speciation. Thank you.